everyone. Welcome to Black Gems Unearthed. My name is Jazz and I'm studying Black history of Massachusetts. Today I have contemporary history to share that's only partially about Massachusetts. I'm here in Cambridge at Harvard University at the law school to talk about a Harvard Law School alumni who was a revolutionary figure. He was Harvard Law School's first Latin American graduate and he was an Afro-Latino patriot for Puerto Rico to gain independence from U.S. colonization. I'm here to talk about the story of Pedro Albizo Campos. Before I talk about Pedro though, let me give you some historical context about Puerto Rico. The island of Boranquin, as the Taino native people called the island, was conquered and colonized by Spain for about 400 years. In 1898, Spain gave Puerto Rico to the United States as part of the Treaty of Paris at the end of the Spanish-American War. The people of Puerto Rico were not in agreement with this. Many of them were not in agreement because just a few months prior, Spain finally gave the people of Puerto Rico their independence. So people like Pedro argue that Spain did not have the right to give the island to another nation to colonize. It was not their island to make the decision on. Pedro fought tirelessly for the liberation of Puerto Rico as the president of the Puerto Rican Nationalist Party from 1930 until his death in 1965. He was a real thorn in the side of the United States in their financial interests in Puerto Rico. He spent his formative years right here in Cambridge studying at Harvard University. So let's take a stroll around this Harvard campus through this law school area in particular and I'll tell you about Pedro's story and his experiences here at Harvard. We're passing by buildings of Harvard Law School that Pedro likely would have spent time inside of or passed by while he studied here. But before I talk about his time in the law school, let me just tell you about his upbringing. Pedro was born in 1891 in Ponce, Puerto Rico. His mother was Juliana Campos, a mestiza woman or a mixed woman of African, Taino, and Spanish heritage and she was the daughter of former enslaved workers in Puerto Rico. His father was Alejandro Albizu Romero, and he was a Basque merchant who was a descendant of Spanish immigrants to Puerto Rico. Pedro was actually raised by his aunt since his mother passed away when he was young, and his father did not recognize him until much later, until he actually attended this Harvard University. Pedro was a really smart kid, and he received a scholarship to attend the University of Vermont in 1912. And a year later, he ended up transferring over to Harvard to study chemistry and literature. He ends up being the first Puerto Rican graduate of Harvard. In 1921, he graduated from Harvard's law school. He actually had the top scores in the class and should have been the valedictorian, but unfortunately he was discriminated against by a couple of professors who delayed his graduation. They did not want to see a black person give the valedictorian speech. This was not Pedro's first experience with discrimination. He experienced it when he fought in World War I. Between his experience with discrimination and his experience helping with the Irish push for liberation from colonialism, these things shaped Pedro Albizo Campos' desire to be a social activist. Pedro lived off of this Mount Auburn Street for a portion of his time while he attended Harvard University. I believe this building behind me is located where he lived, although this is not the same exact building when he was here. Now Pedro's time at Harvard University was interrupted in order to fight in World War I. Pedro was one of many Puerto Ricans that fought in World, I, in World War I, and that's because President Woodrow Wilson in 1917 in March, he gave Puerto Ricans U.S. citizenship with the Jones Act. And just a couple months after that, he signed a compulsory military act that drafted Puerto Ricans into the war. There were some 20,000 Puerto Ricans that fought in World War I. And a lot of people 
give it a side eye that they received the citizenship just in time to go join the United States battle in World War I, when again, many Puerto Ricans did not even want to be a part of the United States. They wanted to be an independent country and nation. So Pedro fights in the war, and that is where he experiences discrimination. He's forced to serve in an all-black regiment because of his skin complexion. He serves in the 375th Infantry. So the discrimination that he experienced and also what he observed happening to black people when he was down in a southern port really shaped his, his outlook on the U.S. and Puerto Rican relations. While he served in the war, he paid close attention to learn the tactics just in case in the future he needed to call upon that information in order to create defense for Puerto Rico. When Pedro returned to Harvard, he was very involved in student life. He was the president of the Cosmopolitan Club, and he was also involved with the Catholic Student Association that was associated with this St. Paul's parish behind me. And Pedro actually converts to Catholicism while he's attending Harvard University because he has a couple of friendships with priests who also served as mentors and they shared with him their faith and also shared stories about Ireland's struggle for independence from Britain. Pedro actually gets involved with both the colonial struggle of Ireland and India. He gets involved with campaigns while attending Harvard University. He meets the Irish Republican leader Emin de Valera in Boston and Emin actually has him help him with drafting the Irish Constitution. And as far as India goes, we know that Pedro attends lectures on campus about India's independence struggle. He attended lectures by a gentleman named Subhash Chandra Bosi and Subhas advocated for independence for India by any means necessary, including the use of violence. So Pedro's experience listening to Subhas Chandra Bosi and working with Emin de Valera were parts of his experience at Harvard that shaped his future with activism in Puerto Rico. Over here at the philosophy department, Pedro locked eyes with his future wife, Laura Meneses del Caprio. They both were here attending a presentation by the Hindu poet and Nobel laureate Rabindrath Tagore. I believe that's how his name is pronounced. I actually haven't heard it in person, so my apologies if I'm wrong. But the two of them both happened to attend a presentation here, and Laura believed that he was a gentleman because he stepped out of the way to allow her to pass by. And evidently, Harvard men didn't have that level of courtesy to women in this co-ed space. Laura was a very intelligent woman. She was the first Latin American woman accepted to this Radcliffe College, which is now part of Harvard University, but at that time was a woman's institute that was just associated with Harvard. She was a biologist and she was originally from Peru. Laura and Pedro got married in 1922 and they were married for 43 years. But of those 43 years, they really only spent 13 together because Pedro was in and out of prison due to his social activism on the part of Puerto Rico and Puerto Rico's independence. Laura kind of lived up to that, that phrase that behind every great man, there is a great woman because as Pedro was in jail or in prison, she was his voice and spoke on his behalf. When Pedro graduated from Harvard Law School in 1921, he could have went anywhere for work. He spoke six languages and had expertise in law, chemical engineering, literature, and philosophy. But Pedro decided to dedicate his life to pushing for independence for Puerto Rico. He and Laura decided to go back to Puerto Rico. They moved to Ponce, where Pedro practiced law for poor people. Additionally, he joined the Puerto Rican Nationalist Party in 1924. By 1930, he became president of the party. 
and he gained attention from the U.S. government when he became involved in 1934 with a island-wide agricultural strike for sugarcane workers. He helped with organizing the Labor Party. And so they were able to raise the wage of sugar workers from 45 cents to $1.50 for a 12-hour workday to get their income a little bit closer to being able to pay for the cost of living. So the strike caused a lot of issues on Wall Street, which is why the U.S. government started to pay attention to Pedro Albizo Campos' activities. And unfortunately, in 1936, they imprisoned Pedro on sedition charges because of his organizing of strikes, like these sugarcane workers and other industries too. They really wanted to shut Pedro down because he was just too smart and he was too charismatic. He publicly pointed out the hypocrisy of the United States colonizing Puerto Rico, considering that the United States was supposed to be the leader of the free world. One quote that I read from Pedro said that, he said that, according to the Yankees, to own one person makes you a scoundrel, but to own a nation makes you a colonial benefactor. <laughs> Whoa, talk about shade. So he was always pointing out the contradiction of the United States in their treatment of Puerto Rico. Pedro was released from prison in 1942, but even still, the FBI closely monitored his every move once he got out because they knew how smart and vocal he was. In 1950, he was put back in prison because he organized the Puerto Rican Nationalist Revolt of 1950. The revolt was a series of uprisings across the island that were armed. They were trying to get international attention as to what was happening in Puerto Rico because the United States was trying to take Puerto Rico from a territory status to a commonwealth. And many people did not want this. They wanted Puerto Rico to be independent. And they could not speak out vocally because of the gag law of 1948. People who spoke out against the government were, could have been placed into prison for 10 years and or received a $10,000 fine. This was dangerous stuff for Puerto Ricans. So Pedro, he used his knowledge from the Irish uprising because remember he was involved with the efforts to help Ireland to become independent. He used his knowledge of the uprising to organize this revolt. In addition to the tactical skills he learned from being in the military for World War I. The U.S. press did not publicize much of what happened with the revolts. They did publicize that there was an assassination attempt on Harry Truman and they just framed it as a couple of poor Puerto Ricans that were crazy, that were terrorists, so that the world would not know the extent of what was happening in Puerto Rico. The U.S. did not want the world to know. But today, now that people have peeled the onion back, we all know, or we can know through studying our history, that there was a series of uprisings in about nine different cities. And the U.S. had a really strong hand in quelling the revolts. A lot of force was used. In fact, they used the military to have an aerial bombing on the town of Utuado, something that I don't think has ever been done before by the military against their own citizens. The book, The War Against Puerto Ricans, and also their website does a really awesome job of explaining the play-by-play -play of what happened during the revolts. But back to Pedro, he's placed into prison in 1950 because of his involvement organizing this series of events. And in prison, he's subject to torture, radiation torture. There was experimentation that was going on on the prison that was causing his skin to, to burn and have lesions, and people didn't believe him. He actually wrapped his body in wet towels to try to soothe the burning, and the, the patrol guards called him crazy. They called him a rey de las toallas because he was wearing these towels, the king of the towels, but it wasn't true. Much later in history, we found out that there was radiation experiments going on in prisons. Pedro was released in 1964 because he had a stroke and he was so, so near death, so he was pardoned. And a year later, in 1965, he passed away. About 75,000 people attended his funeral procession. 
Pedro really did spend his entire life fighting for Puerto Rican independence. The U.S. and the FBI labeled him as a radical, as a terrorist, as a criminal, but really he was an educator and a liberator. That's why people today call him El Maestro, the teacher, because he wanted to teach the people of Puerto Rico self-determination and independence. In the details of this video, you'll be able to find the sources that I learned all this information from today so that you can learn more about Pedro Albizo Campos and also about Laura Meneses del Caprio, who I only spoke about a little bit. Thanks for listening to Black Gems Unearthed. Hey y'all, I see you're here for my food adventure. So today I went over to the port area of Cambridge, so this is not right in Harvard Square, but it's not too far away in order to come to this restaurant, Izzy's, that's been here for like 40 plus years. It's family owned and they make amazing Puerto Rican food. So I ordered food and it should be ready for me momentarily. I bought myself a little feast over at Izzy's. So from my main dish, I got the stewed chicken, the pollo guisado, and I also got with it the tostones, which are the fried plantains, the ones that are more savory. And then I also got, just for good measures, you know, you can't have too much food. I got this, the fried pork, which I think is chicharrones, I think. I'm not sure, I just always go for the fried pork can't go wrong. So that's what I'm going to have from my lunch today and I'll see you guys soon for my next video. I hope you get a chance to go check out Izzy's if you're in this area of Massachusetts. Thanks for watching.